Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon, morning, or evening to you, wherever you may be. Welcome to another edition of A Reason for Hope in our newly updated studio here. I am joined here by my right-hand man, protege, all-around good guy, Sean Richards. We have behind the scenes Adrian Van Vactor, who's making sure that all the buttons are pushed and all the uh, circuits are flowing as they should. Uh, we are really excited to be spending some time with you in God's Word today. So if you've got questions about the Bible, what the Bible has to say about what's going on in your life personally, maybe a biblical perspective on uh, the events of the day or even the events of tomorrow through biblical prophecy. And of course, if uh, you have tough questions regarding the Christian faith or maybe have been asked a tough question, felt a day late and a dollar short, as far as being able to give a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and reverence, we would love for you to join on in. All you have to do is uh, jump on one of our various uh, media platforms and get our questions to us. Sean, how can people get their questions to us today? Well, if you are joining us online, you can join us on our website, calvarychristianfellowship.com. Again, C-A-L-V-A-R-Y, Christian Fellowship is our website. If you click on the Watch Live tab, the purple bar at the top of the screen will direct you to a page that is, of course, titled uh, ccftucson.online.church. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll be able to chat with us, and we'll be keeping an eye on that box, as well as our social media platforms for your questions to engage with us live. Also, if you join us there, we'll have a countdown to our next broadcast and our biweekly Bible study at our local fellowship. And if you'd like to join us there, of course, the internet holds no boundaries in that regard, at least not yet. Our social media platforms. Uh, Facebook is Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson, and if you like us there, we'll be able to notify you when we are going live, and our YouTube page will provide that as well at A Reason for Hope. Subscribe to us there and hit the notification bell and whatever they add to make it more complicated in the future. But note that if we aren't going live for any reason, even prescribed reasons, we want to make sure that you are aware it is, if not the result of technical malfunctions on my part, we'll give you a notification in advance if that's the case. But if we're taken down on YouTube and Facebook, which we don't have control over, we still will be able to upload our messages to our website. So feel free to join us there. Try to make that your most frequent and most dependable place for engaging with us, and we'll be looking forward to receiving your questions, which once again is at calvarychristianfellowship.com on the Watch Live tab. If you'd like to send us questions after the broadcast as well, at the bottom of the screen we'll have our email address spelled out for you, and if you're listening to us on Reach Radio or one of our radio affiliates, it is questions, plural, F-O-R, hope, at gmail.com. Okay. Well, having said that, why don't we open up in a word of prayer? Lord, thanks so much that we have this opportunity today to explore your word together. We pray that you guide the conversation, you lead us to the questions that you want to have answered, and the scriptures uh, that can give us uh, solid answers, not just uh, encouraging our minds, but uh, touching and blessing our hearts and leading us to a, a closer relationship with you. We thank you for this. We commit this time to you. We pray you'd be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. And by the way, for those listening, uh, I'm not doing an impression of our dear friend Ronnie Simone. Uh, if you were able to listen on Friday, <laughs> I was uh, down with a bit of a, well, not a flu as per yet, but uh, definitely a fever. If the last three days were described as a hurricane, right now I'm in overcast, but prayers for a full recovery would be appreciated. Yeah. So starting us off, uh, we received an email question revisiting a topic we, of course, eagerly jump into whenever we can. It's regarding the Bible's view of suicides, particularly those uh, participated and enacted by a believer. When someone takes their life as a non-believer, obviously the default is to, well, they're in the hands of a God who will do all things well, Genesis 18. But if we're in the hands of a fellow believer, it's obviously a lot more difficult because people's imaginations will wander to any and every direction but productive ones in essentially trying to rationalize right. for themselves 
already in a state of grief perspectives that Scripture may not, in fact, be presenting. Yeah. So when we're looking, obviously, for examples of suicide in the Bible, none of them are positive. If we're looking for demonstrations of suicide in the Bible, none are exemplary. But when it comes to the state of the non-believer, the thing that all of the loved ones involved with this loss are most concerned about, what is the most level-headed and scripturally informed position? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, the, Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Costa Mesa always used to uh, say to us, uh, when you don't know what to do next, fall back on what you do know. And I think when we find ourselves in a place where we're uh, dealing with an issue, uh, where maybe uh, we uh, are lacking a bit of clarity, then obviously that same principle can apply. Uh, fall back on the scriptural principles you do know and understand, rather than uh, trying to rely on the scriptural principles that we don't at a particular time uh, understand. And, and so in the case of uh, a situation where a person and the email pertained to an individual who had a, a very uh, strong and unequiv unequivocal uh, testimony of uh, faith in Jesus, and uh, yet ended up taking her own life. Uh, you know, it was very uh, difficult for people to wrap their minds around that sort of thing. But there were a number of uh, circumstances that surrounded that, and we really can't go into a lot of detail about it just to uh, preserve confidences and so on. But when people would ask the question, okay, where do you suppose this person is? You know, when an, an individual takes their life, uh, first of all, we have to ask ourselves the question, were they in their right mind if you will, when that happened, was a person rational? Were there some other, ex, you know, extraneous circumstances uh, that led a person to make that decision? I think that's an important thing to take into account, and it's certainly something that God is going to take into account. But as far as the things that we can really know from Scripture, and I think this is really what it comes down to, is, is this: What does the Bible say is our hope of heaven? How do we get to heaven? in the first place. And, you know, I uh, go back uh, quite a bit uh, when this question comes up to uh, a very clear statement that Jesus makes in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and verse 24. He said this, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not enter into judgment, but is passed from death into life. So when we're dealing with a situation where someone has taken their life, and they have a testimony of faith in Jesus, uh, you know, I, I go back to that. I just say, well, what is, what is all of our hope of heaven? It really kind of comes down to the fact that uh, God has grace on us. You know, we, we go to John three sixteen, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, notice it doesn't say, whoever believes in him shall not perish, and, uh, of course, doesn't commit suicide, uh, you know, then they'll have everlasting life. Uh, you know, there are people who bring up the scripture in the Gospel of John, or First uh, John, uh, that, say, that says uh, no murderer has eternal life in him, and suicide is self-murder. And so, you know, how can a person like that possibly get into heaven? Well, same way all of us get into heaven, by God's uh, amazing grace. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, one of the, the real casualties that happens when someone takes their life is, uh, is this. A person, uh, in essence, leaves that question uh, to those who've been left behind. And, uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, there is, uh, as you mentioned, no positive uh, example of uh, a person who commits suicide, no uh, example of an individual who's a genuine believer in Christ, uh, or even in the Old Covenant who committed suicide. You know, the, the, the hardest thing is uh, we just don't know where that person is. We just don't know what their eternal destiny is. But here's the deal. God does. And so when we're sharing with somebody in a set of circumstances, circumstance like that, uh, what I try to do is I try just to bring it back to uh, what is our hope of eternal life for any of us. Uh, if it has anything to do with the, the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf and our good works, well, that's a pretty shaky foundation to stand upon. The only real uh, form of assurance of salvation that any of us have is what Jesus did for us, not anything 
uh, that we do for Jesus, either by omission or commission. So uh, in a circumstance like that, I just try to bring people back to the cross of Christ, to focus in on the lengths that God went to to make eternal life possible for any of us. And if he's gone to such lengths as Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 28, uh, or I should say uh, verse 31 says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who will be against us? If he didn't spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how long not along with him? Freely give us all things. Uh, you know, if God went to those lengths to make salvation possible, he's going to go to any length uh, necessary to make salvation personal and practical and permanent in, in, a, in a life. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the problem though, Sean, is I just try not to say more than what Scripture says. You know, I don't say, oh, well, definitely, we know, you know, this person, uh, you know, is, uh, is definitely there in heaven. That's one of uh, the casualties of someone you know, committing suicide, we don't know. But we do know, as you mentioned at the beginning, Genesis 18, 25 says, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? All right yeah, so fall back on the nature of salvation. And as a follow-up, we have a question from Yari, who wants to know, have, uh, referring to me, ever struggled with suicide dealing with mental illness? And he has some neighbors who struggle and have mental conditions. I won't draw attention to myself or depress all of you with my struggles, but in regards to, I think, giving this a biblical question spin, uh, how would you counsel someone not having committed suicide because they're dead, but who is struggling with suicidal thoughts or tendencies? I think that would be a more productive question. Yeah, well, uh, a few things, uh, and you know, I'm sure uh, you can uh, bear witness with this. Uh, number one, uh, we just go to John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, you know, if we're thinking about taking our lives, in essence, what we're getting down to is saying, well, God, I just don't believe that uh, the life you've given me, uh, I don't think you're handling it properly, and so I need to intervene and do something in my life that you're not doing. In other words, God has us there for a reason. Jesus said that he has come to give us life and life more abundantly. Now, notice that term, more abundantly, doesn't mean it's going to be an easy life doesn't mean he's going to take away every struggle and, and problem that we have, but it's going to be an abundant life. And when it's all said and done, when we stand before the Lord someday, you know, there's going to be rewards for those times where we have said to God, you know, um, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And those who struggle with the, the idea of wanting to take their life or wanting to end profound and pronounced sufferings, well, uh, those people are going to be rewarded for remaining faithful to God, even when it was very, very difficult, when even when their emotions and even their mental processes were arguing uh, the other direction. You know, the other thing I would say is this, in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1, uh, we are told uh, that uh, the one who isolates himself uh, puts themselves in a very difficult uh, situation. They seek their own desire. Uh, they rail against all wise judgment. And so when a person is struggling with those kind of thoughts, one of the most important things is to uh, reach out and connect. You know, it's uh, Memorial Day today, and uh, our uh, good friend uh, Jesse Kelly, who's been a friend of our family and uh, attended our church here for a while before he moved to Houston, had some really uh, powerful things to say on his particular webcast, being a Marine veteran, uh, about Memorial Day and how tough that is on a lot of uh, veterans who come home, who've lost their brothers in arms and are, are struggling. And, you know, his exhortation was reach out, don't isolate yourself. You know, if you feel like you're, you're saying, oh, you know, I've, I've lost my friends and so on, and it's leading you down uh, that path, you know, don't try to battle that alone. You know, reach out to other people if you possibly can. And I think that's another important thing that people who struggle in that particular area uh, need to do. They need to have people that they know will understand them, know will pray for them, uh, and uh, even as difficult as it might be, and as easy as it would be to isolate, they need to avoid isolation uh, like the plague. But uh, the most important thing is just to kind of go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, as Jesus was struggling uh, with uh, a situation where he was on the edge of, uh, of losing his life just because of the sheer pressure he was facing, uh, staring down the barrel of the crucifixion and bearing the sins of the world. 
you know, praying, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, notice Jesus not only did that, but he also sought prayer support from other people. I think if we follow Jesus' example, get prayer support from other people, pray like Jesus prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, you know, I think uh, the Lord is definitely going to give a, a person in that set of circumstances the strength to persevere. And the other thing is this, and, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, it's, what do they call it, the old 30-minute uh, rule. Things are going to look different in 30 minutes. You know, you know, you might feel overwhelmed at a particular time. If you can hang on and hang in for even 30 minutes, things could change and change uh, radically. Yeah, and if there's any other passages to note for memory's sake especially, but also for study, is Second Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul is specifically speaking of infirmities as not a reason to stop, but a reason to rejoice, right. something that makes Christ's power manifest, and also keeping that in perspective with the point Paul was making in Romans 7, because whether it's something you're born with, like in my case, or with Jesse Kelly and his experiences, or Peter Martin as well, well in his time in the service, all of these things are going to be something you carry with you, but it's not something that you have to carry alone. Now, unfortunately, human nature, being what it is in a self-destructive and fallen state, gets comfortable in the emotional state we are presently in, whether that's happiness and wanting to stay happy, or sadness and wanting to stay sad, thus the tendency yeah. towards isolation. We yeah. perpetuate negative or positive emotions, because right. we're comfortable comfortable there. And the same is true for outright desperation, as odd as it seems. So when we're in those places, we need to first recognize the problem, which is the point of Romans 7. There is a problem, and it's me. Yeah. And the second part is noting that problem isn't the final answer. That isn't the end of the story. That right. Christ's power is made perfect in that problem and weaknesses. So if we don't let our pride, and this is a confession on my part, essentially essentially dictate how we're supposed to respond and say that I have the sole authority, it's my body and my choice. No, Christ died for you. Now you have the opportunity to live right. for him. As far as a non-believer's perspective, that's the tragedy of it all. But that would be where I'd recommend in my own time and struggle. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, again, I've, I've, you know, there's, I think, two equal and opposite reactions I think people will have in those circumstances. There will be some, especially if you come from a Roman Catholic background where suicide is viewed as a mortal sin. You do that, there's no hope. Yeah, great. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the thing that we have to be careful of is not, you know, minimizing the sin of suicide, and it is a sin, but not making it the unforgivable sin, not something that God can, in fact, forgive if uh, a person has a relationship with him. And as I said, you know, in the situations I've been in where a professing believer has done that, inevitably there's uh, been physical and, uh, and uh, you know, even uh, health concerns uh, that an individual had that definitely had to be taken into consideration when evaluating that sort of thing. Fortunately, there is only one judge of all the earth, and he will do what is right. And I'm not him, and you're not him. And, uh, you know, getting a consensus of people about, well, do you think this person's in heaven or not? Uh, that's up to God, and God always gets it right. Yep. A uh, question from Mike who wants to know if it's wrong to celebrate the birth of a baby conceived and born outside of wedlock. Uh, well, as far as that being something to condemn Mike, no child's birth is ever condemned or considered a negative thing, regardless of the circumstances or behavior of their parents. The reason why God doesn't want children to enter this world outside of the influence of a father and a mother is because it's less than ideal. But to say that that if you don't have the ideal, you're somehow to be ashamed of your existence is ridiculous. I'd look at the Old Testament, and I'd note people who were used by God powerfully, despite the circumstances of their birth, the most prominent of which was Jabez, in his prayer, and his namesake, of course, being an ironic uh, twist towards the contribution he ended up having on yeah. history. Is, he was a child of a prostitute, obviously, in that set of circumstances, with some more shame tacked on. And his name, his mother obviously had a lot of high hopes for him, just made yeah. him burdensome. Yeah. The whole point was, God, don't let me be a burden to people, but you be my treasure. Yeah, yeah. Or, or think of uh, Jephthah. Yeah. Uh, he was an individual that uh, came from a pretty uh, 
I, I would say, questionable family background. And God raised him up to be a judge over all of Israel. And you note the Messianic line and plenty of other people who had even weirder family origins. But the point being made is this. Life is life, and that's what's to be separated. A sin is a sin, but that doesn't mean that you're to be ashamed of what God can do in spite of that. Yeah, and, you know, I just kind of go back to uh, Psalm 127 and verse 3. Uh, where we are told, uh, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, the womb is a reward. Now, it doesn't just say children that are born to godly families are a heritage from the Lord. You know, every child born into this world is a blessing from God. And uh, there's no such thing in God's economy as a, an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, God is the one who gives life to all of those children. So as such, Mike, I would say that uh, the birth of every child, in a sense, is worth celebrating. Now, if uh, the, uh, the, there, there's other factors that get involved, like saying, oh, yeah, everybody should have a child out of wedlock. Uh, isn't this a great thing? You know, uh, we need to present the whole counsel of God, obviously, and be able to say, yeah, you know, that's why we encourage people that, you know, say you, uh, you know, had fallen into, uh, say, sexual sin and are expecting to go ahead and get married because every child should have a mom and a dad. And uh, that obligation and responsibility in ministry is something that, uh, that, that every child should have if possible. But uh, as far as saying, oh, well, you know, they were born out of wedlock, you know, they were, you know, I, I just can't see celebrating that. Uh, don't concentrate so much on the circumstance, uh, concentrate uh, on, on the child, because every child that comes to the world is just an amazing blessing. We just had such a, a wonderful baby dedication uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, th this, uh, this baby uh, that was dedicated, uh, I, I've done a lot of baby dedications, and uh, the, the mom was holding this, this little girl, and I was praying for this little girl, and she reached over and she grabbed my hand while I was praying. And it was just, it was like one of those moments where I was all choked up. And, you know, so uh, those, those children are a, a blessing from the Lord. Focus in on that, Mike. I think you'll be fine. All right. Um, two questions from Isaiah. Uh, first, in regards to the how to be more like the church of Philadelphia and Sam Wright. I don't uh, know which one that was. I think you mean uh, Smyrna or Sardis or something. But uh, nonetheless, the positive church is yeah, the one Jesus didn't have. In, in Revelation chapter 3. Sure. But the other church uh, referring to the persecuted church, that of course was those who were faithful in the Smyrna. face of persecution. Smyrna, yeah. But um, the other question is what are the dietary laws? Uh, what was their purpose, I believe, Isaiah, is what you were asking previously. We didn't have the chance to go over it on Friday, and by we, I mean you, Bo and Adrian. Um, let's start with the seven churches, because there's a bit of not necessarily controversy, but a lot more confusion than I think is warranted. Much like anything else in Revelation, when people don't uh, start with the first 65 books, yeah. and they get to the 66 and start saying, okay, well, here's my instruction for godly living. Right. The purpose of the book of Revelation is given to us in the first chapter and the first verse, not in the second and third chapters. Right. The first verse Revelation, got it committed to memory, is the title. Right. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's right. So if that's not the, the Antichrist. Not, not the tribulation, yeah. not the resurrection not even the millennium. Yeah. Although it does include those details, yeah. it is not the focus. So if we go to Revelation looking for anything less than that, or more than that, but I cringe at even suggesting such a thing, we're missing the point. So that's the first uh, clue. The second thing we need to note is that at the end of the seventh or first chapter of Revelation, there was a keen emphasis as to why Jesus was writing to the churches, and that wasn't because he needed to sort out which ones were the superior churches and which ones were the inferior. He was speaking to what? Churches, which right. means that they were dwelling places filled with people that all shared the same mindset, that were still called... Gatherings of believers. Yeah. And that's what church means. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is that Jesus treats Ephesus, the loveless church, as a church. And though he gives them warnings and saying that I would take away your lampstand if this continues, it's a serious thing that needs to be dealt with. He's dealing with them. He's 
correcting them. And what does he say, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the very chapters where he's making these rebukes? In Revelation chapter 3, what does it say? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So if that's the emphasis, then we shouldn't adopt this mindset of saying, oh no, I'm the church of Ephesus, i got to be more like the church of Smyrna, where do I go to get some persecution? Or, oh man, I'm a church of Laodicea, how do I get back to being the church of Philadelphia? No, you are what you are, and you are where you are. And this is where I think there is some benefit in hearing the different perspectives, but also coming to informed conclusions on how people have handled the book of Revelation over time. Uh, There's a good book on this in regards to just a record of people who've had any view of the end times, varying from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, Dispensationalism Before Darby. This is written, or I guess compiled rather, it's more just a list of records. But William C. Watson's book, Uh, covers and essentially debunks the whole theory that the idea of, or even a perspective on the pre-tribulation rapture, or even looking at the Bible from the lens of Israel still having a future purpose in God's world, is, of course, uh, that that was a new invention, that that's just false. But when we're talking about the idea of, okay, how has this been handled over time, and what are the pros and the cons of that kind of handling of Scripture? Because, no, that should be our goal in any study, not to say, well, this is the right one because my pastor said so, or this is the right one because this is what makes the most sense to me. I'm blessed with plenty of people in my life who, if I think something or say something stupid, they'll call me out on it. I, I am just so incredibly blessed to have a roommate who has no filter when it comes to if him hearing something stupid, he'll tell me. Uh, He was uh, out of town with his family for the last two weeks, and I I had to make up for lost time. I just felt like saying dumb stuff so I would know he loved me again, but I digress. The, The point being made is this. If we isolate ourselves from perspectives other than our own, then we're always going to think we're right, because we wouldn't have an idea if we didn't think it was right. But if, on the other hand, we don't check those interpretations, then we're going to end up uh, I guess not isolated, but in a echo chamber is the word, yeah. and that's not healthy. So the three ways that people have handled the seven churches throughout history, and I think the first has the most merit, but all have some bearing, otherwise no one would have had them, and I'm not including ones written by cult groups, by the way. The first and the most plain is that this is an overview of the spiritual state of the church as a whole, that this encompassing overview is where any particular believer would find themselves in their relationship with God, and outlined by these seven churches that were literally on the same route uh, going through Asia. It's a semicircle in Asia Minor. Yeah, yeah, which is modern-day Western Turkey, specifically. But the point being made is through these cities, you have seven different spiritual states that would describe any Christian in their walk with God, and how Jesus would deal with them directly. Now, if I look at Philadelphia, where were they? They were in a place where they were holding true to what God had told them to do, holding true to what God had said to them, and were taking advantage of what little or what mo or the most opportunities they had been given. They were faithful in a little, they would be rewarded right. for much. That was the overview. Right. But does that make them the superior church? Not at all. They're treated and spoken to just like any of the other churches, as a church. And in fact, the churches that received correction were, if for no other purpose, being shown more love than Philadelphia, because if you don't have to correct the kid... Or Smyrna, yeah. And here's a at-home illustration. Say... Uh, just to throw myself under the bus here, I have a younger sibling, Sarah. When I was little, was I more comparable to her, or was I the one that needed more attention, more correction, more timeouts? And Uh, by the way, full disclosure, I'll sign my waiver, no problem sharing this embarrassing information. I was insane. I still am, but I've learned manners, right? (laughs) But if on the other... Every two-year-old is, but go ahead. Well, (laughs) mine kind of persisted until high school, but the point being made is this. If I was being shown patience by my father, that meant that he loved me, not that I was the inferior child. Sarah was a lot easier to deal with, especially at younger ages. But that didn't make her the superior child. It just meant that the opportunities you had to show love for her were fewer and far between because you were so busy dealing with me. Yeah, you love your kids, but you love them differently. That that love is is a given, 
but how that love is manifest is is manifest in different ways. Which didn't mean that Sarah never needed correction, nor did it mean that I never got things right, but where each church was at is also handled. This is the first perspective where each believer is at. If you want to be the church, you want to be in Christ, then let Jesus correct you when you need correction. Then let Jesus comfort you when you're going through times of persecution. Let Jesus correct you if you're letting ungodly influences take place in your life. Let Jesus correct you if you are in a compromised and sinful state in your life. Let Jesus correct you if you've gone into autopilot in your Christian life. Let Jesus correct you. By the way, I'm going through the churches in order if you haven't noticed the pattern. If you're in a place where you're just faithfully sharing God's Word and enjoying Him, let Jesus correct you if you're starting to take him for granted, but let it all come from him because he loves you where you're at. That would be the first handling. The second handling of the scripture is a prophetic overview, which again is appropriate given the tone of revelation of the church's ages, so to speak, the various stages of church history that have been put uh, forward throughout history. This one, in my personal opinion, is the weakest, not necessarily because it doesn't have merit to a point, but because of the mindset that a lot of people have in reading themselves into Philadelphia and everyone they don't like into Pergamos and uh, and Thyatira, or Laodicea for that matter. When we're talking about the various stages of church history, we obviously say it was more a mess than a uh, state of progress, but it didn't mean that we didn't do anything right. If on the other hand, though, we were to note, again, through that documentation given throughout history, and you read any historical chronicler that made a comment using Revelation, it was always with that bent in mind. How do I, I make myself out to be the superior church, and how do I make everyone else out to be the inferior church, which once again I think is an unproductive reading of Scripture, to build up your pride rather than to pursue godliness, which 99.101% of the time is going to require some correction, yeah. if you get the joke. Yeah. So the point being made is this. If I take this approach to Scripture, what's the most practical takeaway? Again, I don't say that it's not without merit. Very smart, capable, and intelligent people have handled this and handled it, I think, consistently. But the key needs to be this. Am I looking for correction, or am I looking for pride? Am I looking at myself and saying, how do I fit into these churches? No, if there's any self-examination, it's saying, where is Jesus with me? And if I fit into a church I don't particularly like, then I take the correction. But, and this is in regards to your question, Isaiah, if I fit into a church that was given positive notes, then I take their commendations, and I make sure that I stay in the notes that he makes towards them, that they were faithful, that they had an open door before them with their little strength that they had, and that they wouldn't deny his name. But if, on the other hand, you're in another church, it doesn't mean you're an inferior Christian. Just remember that in those places and stages of life, God still loves you where you're at. He didn't love Philadelphia more. He didn't love um, Sardis and uh, um, Laodicea less. In fact, he was more involved in their lives than Philadelphia and Smyrna because that was the whole point. They were fine where they were at. So that would be how he'd handle that second uh, presentation of the passage. And the third, which I think is, again, probably the second weakest because it ends up kind of brushing the whole passage underneath the rug rather than actually doing something with it. The perspective is this was only speaking to those churches at that time, but much like the letters of Paul and the others that were written to specific people at specific times and for specific reasons and places that only fit into their context, they can be applied given their spiritual merit when handled properly and biblically. Now again, I get it. I, I handling Jesus' letters to the churches the same way you would handle Paul's letters to the churches or Peter's letters to the churches, et cetera, et cetera. There is some merit to that, I'll grant it, but not as much as the former two. And why? Because, again, you can't really do much with that, because the moment you try to glean something out, then you have to test that, and right. you have to go get, get into the sticky business. Yeah. So uh, I, I wouldn't say much in regards to that, Isaiah, but that would be the point that I'd make, is if you're finding yourself 
seeking out? Uh, how do I put myself in a position where I'm only able to perceive myself as one of the good churches? How do I make sure that I'm the church of uh, Smyrna or the church of Philadelphia, not those yucky churches that Jesus had to correct all the time? Hey, we're all going to need correction. In fact, the more you seek it out, the better. But the point being made is this, whether you take it from a historical lens, a present prophetic lens or an overview of church history where you can then also note and apply yourself as well, I think there's merit for all three. But just note what's been talked about and let us know if you need any further clarification. If you want to be Philadelphia, then be Philadelphia. Know what they had going for them and do that. But if you're not going to honestly assess yourself and say, I'm not Philadelphia right now. I'm quite frankly probably close to Thyatira. Well, do what Jesus did, repent, and do the first works, and know that what you have won't be taken away from you. If you say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of taking Jesus for granted, everything's so kind of hunky-dory right now, especially here in the United States, I'm not really dependent on his spirit right. like I should be. Then take his correction, repent, and know where your relationship started with. The same for Ephesus, same for... What was the one they associate with the Roman Catholic Church? The uh, uh, Pergamon. Pergamon today. Yeah. Thank you. Wherever you are, just make sure Jesus ministers to you there. Anything more to add to that before we get to the dietary laws? Um, no, but uh, Ben has a question that I think dovetails on this same subject we can deal with pretty quickly here. How do you let God correct you? Well, uh, again, how can a young man keep his way pure? We're told in Psalm 119 by keeping it according to his word. The number one way that God corrects us is he has given us God's basic instructions before leaving earth in the Bible. The more we become familiar with God's word, the more we begin to understand those things that please the Lord and those things that are displeasing to the Lord, the more we're going to be able to make spirit-led and spirit-informed decisions to say no to the things of this world that uh, charm us most and yes to those things that are going to lead us to the fullness of life that we could have in Christ. And so sticking in the Word, I think, is an important thing. Another way that the Lord um, can uh, correct us and uh, guide us into His truth is uh, by using our consciences, if you will, uh, to, uh, to d direct and guide us. You know, maybe we aren't as familiar with God's Word as we could be, Maybe we're in a situation where things are coming at us pretty rapidly and we can't find ourselves saying, uh, we find ourselves saying, oh my goodness, I, I just don't uh, know how to deal with these sort of things. Well, God gives us a conscience as well. Uh, and uh, when we're born again, we have a born again conscience. And in uh, the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19, Paul said, having faith in a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. If we train ourselves to turn down the volume of our conscience when we're confronted with tough moral decisions, uh, if we uh, sear our conscience as with a hot iron, Paul warns about false prophets doing that in the last days, then that's, that's a problem. But God does give us that sense of this is good or this is not, or even a sense of guilt or shame that might associate with certain things. And so, you know, when we pay attention to that, God can guide us in that as well. So God's Word, God's conscience, and, of course, uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit through other believers. Wise counsel can be a way that God guides us and, and disciplines us as well. So I think if we pay attention to those things, we're going to be good. All right. And then uh, the second question from Isaiah was, what was the purpose of the dietary laws? And I think uh, making a reference to Exodus 15, where God made a promise to Israel that if you obey my statutes, keep my commandments, that none of these diseases will come upon you, which I caused to come upon the nation of Egypt. For I, the Lord your God, am your healer. That's one of the names of God, God our healer. Yeah. Uh, the writings of a man by the name of S.I. McMillan, I believe it was, uh, he wrote a book called None of These Diseases, where he talked about, as a medical practitioner, all of the physical and medical benefits of keeping the kosher law. But where people think, 
I think, take a step too far, and this is true in borderline cults, some cults outright, but like Seventh-day Adventists and others who would say that you have to keep the dietary laws to be considered righteous. That's not the point. When Israel was under a covenant and law, they were literally being founded as a nation, and their government was given to them by God. Now, obviously, he could have explained to them germ theory and parasitic infections and the, uh, I guess, cyclical nature of how when bottom feeders like lobsters and shrimp and so forth, when they're eating those little things, which are literally pieces of corpses and defecation and so forth, aren't good to ingest in your body unless you prepare them a specific way. You could understand that if God covered every detail he could, the Bible wouldn't be an instruction of spiritual living. It would be a cookbook. We'd have a a chapter on puffer fish because you have to prepare them just the right way or they'll kill you. Yeah, we'll let the Japanese figure it out over time. But the point being made is this. God's goal was to establish a relationship with Israel, and relationships are built on trust. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please him, for you must believe that he is, and a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How would Israel know that he was? By what he had told them and revealed to them. How would they diligently seek him? By obeying those things. That included, don't eat this and do eat that, but make sure that you do it in this way. Now, what would be accomplished with that? Two things in regard to your question. First of all, it would give them the opportunity to do what we all need to do in our relationship with God, trust Him. Not to give them all available information, but to know God enough to say He probably knows what He's talking about when He made these creatures, which one I should and shouldn't eat. Now that we know the practical reasons, then we know the second reason, physical blessing. They would see the benefits of obedience to God, and of course, as he also repeats in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7, that none of those diseases would come on them. Israel wouldn't have to be dealing with trichinosis if they stayed away from pork flesh without properly uh, cooking it to 200 degrees minimum, right? Internal temperature, of course. Yeah, the only only thing that I would add to to that, uh, really at all, and there's a third aspect of it, is that uh, kind of like some of those puzzling passages we find Uh, where, uh, say, for instance, uh, the Lord commanded the people of Israel not to have clothing where you have two fibers that are sewn together. For the priests. You know, but, uh, you know, and also that their fields would be plowed in a certain way that would uh, would not mix crops together and so on. And they wouldn't touch the corners. You know, and and, and so, you know, when you look at that, there's a part of us that seems, well, this seems rather arbitrary, in a certain way, and, and in, to a certain extent, it really is, because what God was doing with the people of Israel was to show that the, the people of Israel were God's distinct people, that they were different from the Gentiles. In fact, when a Gentile would come and go, hey, you know, wh- why do you guys, do, you know, not eat uh, pork or, or certain kinds of shellfish or things like that? They could tell them, well, these are the things that the Lord our God has shown us to do, and this is what makes us distinct. And obviously the physical benefits and blessings that would come from all of that uh, would go hand in hand with it. Interestingly, after this purpose had ended, making the Israelites distinct from all other nations, uh, Jesus declared that all foods were clean. He said that, you know, it's not what goes into your stomach that defiles a man, it's what comes out of your heart that defiles a man. And so, uh, you know, he even uh, went out of his way to show the Apostle Peter a a vision three different times that he should never call something unclean that God has declared clean. And he did that by showing him all these different animals that they weren't supposed to eat as Jewish people as a picture of the fact that they could have relationships with Gentiles and so on. And that's the point. Before you say, oh, this is a scientific error in the Bible, and, you know, he says that there's no longer diseases associated with food because Jesus died on the cross. No, he explains that point. But if, on the other hand, we're going to say the purpose of the kosher law in a legal sense had been fulfilled, yes. Yeah, and and so, you know, again, uh, after that had served its purpose, uh, in God's plan, uh, there was a, a freedom there, uh, you know, and the Apostle Paul had to go into quite a bit of detail about how to use that freedom without blowing other people away. So uh, that would be the only thing that, uh, that I would add to that. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the Old Testament law, and that regards includes the law regarding clean and unclean foods. Not that that changed 
the physical benefits, say, for instance, of avoiding bottom feeding creatures and, and so on. But it uh, changed uh, the, the idea that you are somehow righteous before God because of what you eat or what you don't eat. So righteousness I, was a matter of the heart, not the stomach. So I can have scrimps? Yeah, you can't. <laughs> you, no matter what the pH is in the yeah. water. Yeah. Yeah. Name that reference. Yeah. Uh, question <laughs> from Holly, who wants to know, how do you strengthen your faith? Sometimes it's hard to understand the Bible's trying to say, at least to me. Uh, keep growing and keep reading. If you're in spiritual kindergarten, I remember at that time I had to be read to rather than to read for myself. It wasn't that I should be ashamed of that, but if I was still in that state and I said, well, uh, Daddy, could you read for me the book of Malachi again because someone's asking me a question on the radio and I haven't read that because I can't. Yeah. I just don't want to because I get bored. Well, spiritually, obviously, my attention span, my willingness or desire to be invested in the things of God has developed a little bit since then and always has room to grow. But if I tell myself, okay, am I where I ought to be? Well, I am where I am, and God can use me where I'm at. But if I say, no, I'm always going to be where I presently am, and therefore I should perpetually stay in spiritual kindergarten or have the spiritual constitution of a first grader, well, that would be something to be ashamed of. The author of Hebrews chastises the people of Israel for that when he's speaking to them and saying, I had to give you guys milk when you should be eating solid food. He right. says, I taught you the fundamentals when you guys should be teachers. And yeah. that's how he explains the illustration. So, and again, Holly, I know where you're at in your walk with God. You haven't been at it for a very long time, so just think of it in terms of physical growth. If you're two years old, you shouldn't be ashamed of yourself that you're not running laps around the neighborhood. Focus on walking properly. If you say, well, I can't read these, you know, uh, metaphysics manuals, and I don't uh, know how to spell let alone describe quantum mechanics. It's because you're in first grade. But if, on the other hand, you've been at the your walk with God for 50-something years, and you still say, oh, man, I sinned again. I lost my salvation. Well, that's when my dad and I start rolling our eyes. It's like, you should know this by now. Don't think that you're in the 50-year-old state yet, but don't be that person by making excuses and staying where you are. Yeah, you know, I mean, Holly, uh, one of the most beautiful statements we find in the Word of God is a, a very brief statement that uh, Simon Peter made in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. He said, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of the surest signs that you're dealing with something that is living is that you are growing or that that thing is growing. If there's no growth, chances are there's no life. And so the Christian life is an exercise in growth. The Bible even talks about certain uh, growth stages that we can identify in our walk with God. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12, uh, John writes, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you've known him who's from the beginning. I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. Uh, and he goes on from there. But notice there's spiritual children, individuals that are brand new in their walk with God, and if that's where you are, guess what? God has wonderful things to teach you at that stage. Then there's spiritual young men, if you will, those who've grown a bit, those who are uh, learning to uh, walk their their talk and, and growing and progressing their walk with God. Fighting and, sin. And then there's uh, fathers, those that have a deeper relationship with God. You know, one of the things that I do every morning is I spend a little bit of time uh, reading uh, Pastor Chuck Smith's uh, commentary on the book of Acts. And one of the reasons I read that is because, uh, you know, he still comes across to me like uh, a spiritual dad. And, and the insights that he has in this particular commentary are just things that I can really apply uh, to my life continually. And so I look to him uh, in my life as a spiritual father. Uh, I look to uh, those who are spiritual, uh, say, young men, uh, say, uh, Peter and uh, Sean as they lead uh, this program on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I get so much from them because they're earnestly contending for the faith. And, and then, you know, there are some people that really blow me away because they're just flat out in love with Jesus because they've just come to the faith. And, uh, you know, they'll come up, they'll be so excited and say, man, I think I found something in the Bible I, no one's ever found before. And, and I'll go, what's that? Go, well, it says here, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That, you're right here in John 3, 16. Isn't that awesome? And I'll go, yeah, that really is awesome. And I, and I just, I'm blessed because of their youthful enthusiasm, if you will. So there's, there's something that every stage of growth 
in our walk with God can bring to the table. If you want to know, Holly, uh, what your growth pattern is going to look like, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, uh, Peter talks about uh, that God has given us great and great precious promises, that uh, through these you might be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is the world through lust. In other words, God has made you born again. But then Peter says this, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, has forgotten he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, what things? Pursue these steps of growth. You're, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So there, you know, if you want a... Uh, uh, preview of coming attractions of the different life lessons God is going to teach you right there for you there in Second Timothy uh, or Second Peter I should say uh, chapter one verses five through eleven. So read that and uh, give your life a look and see those areas that God might be working in there. It gets really exciting. All right, um, going back to our top. Uh... I wanted to get to something before uh, contradictions because it has come up and some people have asked me uh, about it. If uh, you don't mind me cutting in there. Uh, a lot of traffic on uh, Twitter uh, about the Top Gun movie that has come out, Top Gun Maverick. It is uh, 30 years after the first Top Gun movie. Talk about some space between sequels. Uh, but uh, this movie has just uh, done uh, tremendous business over the Memorial Day. We had $150 million it made in the first three days of its release. But there's also a controversy that has come up with it in that Tom Cruise, who plays uh, the lead character in that Maverick is his call sign uh, in the movie, is also uh, strongly associated uh, with uh, the Church of Scientology. And uh, again, if uh, you uh, are familiar with Scientology, uh, it has uh, really come under quite a bit of examination there is a, a documentary uh, series that has been put out uh, by the actress uh, Leah Riemani, uh, who came out of Scientology. Uh, it's called Leah Riemani, Scientology and the Aftermath. And uh, there she uh, goes into the stories of individuals who've been damaged by this particular organization. So some people will say, you know, well, what about Scientology? Is it uh, religion? Is it uh, like Christian? Scientology will say, oh, yeah, it's compatible uh, with Christianity. In a nutshell, uh, to those of you who are wondering about it, uh, Scientology teaches, founded by a guy named uh, L. Ron Hubbard. He uh, founded it in 1953. Uh, it was basically a religion that was based on some science fiction novels that he uh, wrote. Uh, and, and a bet. And, uh, yeah, and a bet uh, that he could invent a religion. But uh, Scientology, among other things, that teaches that human beings are immortal, that who you really are is called a thetan, that the uh, world that we live in right now is the aftermath of an intergalactic battle with an evil galactic war, a lord named Xenu, uh, believe it or not, X-E-N-U. I'm not making this up. I'm just telling you what L. Ron Hubbard believed and what Scientology teaches. He didn't teaches. believe it. He claimed it yeah. because he was following through on a bet where he could make money through inventing a religion. Well, <laughs> suffice to say his followers believe it. And uh, that uh, the real you, the Thetan you, is trapped uh, by matter, energy, space, and time. Uh, and that salvation, according to Scientology, comes through a process called auditing. Now, auditing happens when you get uh, go down to the uh, Scientology uh, church and uh, they have a little uh, box called an e-meter where what they call engrams which are memories of past pain and unconsciousness that create energy blockage in you uh, will show up if you talk about certain issues. They ask you certain questions they say well come down we'll give you a personality inventory and the uh, bottom line of their personality inventory is that everybody needs Scientology so you have to sign up for certain courses, and all these courses cost money. Uh, if you go through their whole process, it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they promise you that when all these engrams 
are removed, all these blockages of your energy, you then can control uh, matter, energy, space, and time. In essence, you can become a godlike creature. In fact, uh, in uh, a expose of Scientology that was published in Time magazine, uh, the ultimate revelation that you get to when you're at the top of the uh, heap in Scientology is that L. Ron Hubbard, in fact, is God. Uh, so uh, if uh, you uh, wonder if this is compatible to Christianity, it basically refutes almost every belief that we have as Christians. Uh, the Bible teaches that God is the only creator of the universe and is in control, not Zenu, uh, that mankind was created by God, that salvation is not to be found by going through personality audits and inventories and paying money to people, but only by the free gift of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, uh, that uh, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. It is seated at the right hand of God. Scientology sees Jesus as a tragic victim of, uh, of bad breaks and that he was a very wise individual but was killed because things got out of hand. Uh, that is not what the Bible teaches. Uh, in fact, uh, the Bible teaches that we all have a problem, that we're evil, that we aren't uh, just uh, uh, unrealized spirit beings that just need to have these blocks in our energy removed. Uh, we need to have our sins forgiven and be reconciled to the Creator who has made us. Uh, Scientology denies the deity of Christ. Uh, Scientology denies the sinfulness of man. Scientology believes in reincarnation and that uh, salvation uh, is uh, possible only when you're uh, removed from that endless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And, and so uh, Scientology and the Bible have very little, if, not, if anything, in common. Tom Cruise is a very highly placed individual in uh, Scientology, gives quite a bit of money to Scientology as a result of all of that. Does that mean you should or shouldn't go see the movie? Um, you know, like anything else, you've got to follow through on your own convictions on that particular uh, question. Uh, if someone were to say to you, Sean, should I not go see this movie because Tom Cruise is a Scientologist, what would you say? I'm going to make a joke because we don't have enough time to go into further detail. Hey, if you don't want to see it or you do, you can be my wingman anytime. Okay, so there you go, kind of a reference to that uh, particular movie. But, you know, again, pray about it, just like you pray about everything else. Whatever your hand finds that you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Whether you see it or you don't, do it in harmony with your relationship with God. Uh, and I don't think you're going to go too far wrong. All right, well, the music is going to come on in the next couple of seconds. We won't start a question without the ability to finish it. Maybe a warning. Isaiah uh, wonders if there'll be a Top Gun 3 if the Lord tarries another 30 years. <laughs> um, may the Lord forbid such blasphemy yeah. afflicted on the world. But yeah. uh, if, whether that's the line or not, we should begin every day with the hope that it could be the day he comes for us. So that's we'll right. join you in that prayer and look forward to seeing you all again next time should the Lord tarry. God bless you. God bless you. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.